Hello everyone, surely many of you have either watched or at least heard of the movie titled The Silence of the Lambs at some point in your life. If you don't know in this classic film by the renowned director Jonathan Demme, there is a character that left a lasting impression on the audience, Buffalo Bill, a notorious criminal known for his crimes involving human skin. But did anyone know that this character in the movie was inspired by a real life criminal in American history? Eight years after the film's release, a similar case occurred in Europe, just like in the movie. The story took place in Krakow, the second largest city and the former capital of Poland, located in the south. Krakow is an industrial hub and is also known as the Royal Center due to its ancient beauty and thousands of years of historical relics located here. Flowing through Krakow is the famous Vistula River, which is 1,047 kilometers long and the largest river in Poland, covering two-thirds of the country. Every May, tens of thousands of tourists from all over the world come here to admire the beauty of Vistula. However, at this picturesque and ancient tourist destination, a gruesome murder case took place, taking 18 years to investigate and shocking a large part of Polish society at the time. On a cold January morning in 1999, while crew members were working on a boat docked along the Vistula River in Krakow, they unexpectedly discovered a strange object stuck in the ship's net. Curiously checking it out, they were horrified to realize it was a piece of human skin. Yes, exactly, a piece of human skin. The police and investigators had to be present at the scene immediately. Quickly, the area was cordoned off, and the investigation began, led by Aleski, a veteran investigator known for solving the most difficult cases. Upon arriving at the crime scene, he wasn't too surprised because the river often saw suicide cases. After losing their lives, their bodies were often caught in the ship's propellers. Due to soaking in the river for too long, their skin could tear due to the slime. However, upon preliminary examination, Aleski was startled. Upon observation, he found that the human skin didn't look torn by a ship's propeller, but was expertly skinned. The skin was quite intact, with stitches visible, and was cut very meticulously. Before being found by the crew, he estimated that the skin had been soaking in the river for at least half a month. Based on the shape, it was evident that the victim's limbs and head had been removed. Immediately after, the police began dredging and searching the river. It took them a week to find a human leg and some fragments. The notable point here was that this was the first case in Poland to use DNA analysis in a criminal investigation. Through testing, it was determined that the leg and the skin belonged to the same person, and the victim's identity was quickly discovered. She was a 23-year-old university student named Katarina Zawada. Going back three months prior, one November morning at 6 a.m., Mrs. Zawada, Katarina's mother, went to a psychological counseling office. She had scheduled an appointment with her daughter to meet the doctor together, but after waiting for a long time, Katarina never showed up. With a mother's instinct, she began to feel something was very strange and rushed to her daughter's apartment to search, but she was nowhere to be found. In a state of worry, she contacted the police, briefly explaining the current situation to the dispatcher but was bluntly told that the disappearance time was too short to file a report and was advised to wait patiently, thinking her daughter might have just gone somewhere. Mrs. Zawada, upon hearing this, could only console herself, hoping her daughter had indeed just gone somewhere and would return home soon. But as night fell and her daughter still hadn't returned, she once again reported to the local police, stating that her daughter suffered from severe depression and was missing, hoping the police would search for her. This approach was effective, and the police worked tirelessly for two months until Father Wiswa discovered the human skin. This time, Mrs. Zawada finally received news about her daughter, but it was a separation by death. The mother couldn't bear the shock and fainted. Thanks to the police's encouragement and comfort, her spirits improved somewhat. She firmly requested that the police find the perpetrator. At the time of her death, Katerina was 23 years old a student at Jagiellonian University in Krakow. This is one of the oldest universities in Poland, founded in 1364 and is highly regarded in academic circles. 
During her university years, Katerina seemed to dislike her major, changing it twice. Initially, she studied psychology, but after the first semester, she switched to history. However, not long after, she abandoned history to pursue religious studies. Katerina was a reserved, introverted person who rarely interacted with others. Three years ago, during a mountain climbing trip with her father, a tragic accident caused her father to slip and fall off a cliff, resulting in severe spinal injuries. After timely emergency treatment, fortunately, he was not in life-threatening condition and could self-treat at home. At first, Katerina thought her father's condition would gradually improve with time at home, but unexpectedly, his injuries worsened suddenly, leading to his death. The loss of her father tormented Katerina greatly. She always blamed herself, believing it was her fault that her father had the accident. If she hadn't gone climbing that day, nothing would have happened. Afterward, Katerina often isolated herself in her room, avoiding contact with anyone, and became increasingly introverted. She was later diagnosed with severe depression, becoming visibly negative, and even attempting suicide a few times. Fortunately, her mother discovered and intervened in time, preventing any serious consequences. Her mother was extremely worried about her current condition and frequently took her to the hospital for checkups. After a period of continuous treatment, Katerina's condition showed signs of improvement, but she still avoided contact at school. She often stayed alone in a rented apartment outside the campus, rarely communicating with her mother. Due to Katerina's situation, even if she attended school or not, her lecturers did not notice any difference in class. Back to her case, when she first disappeared, no one knew where she had gone. A neighbor living near Katerina's residence shared that she rarely interacted with anyone, and even when accidentally met on the street, she would just bow her head and silently pass by without greeting. Because of this attitude, neighbors had a bad impression of her, thinking Katerina was an impolite girl. Yet. Who would have thought she would end up in the Vistula in such a miserable state? Based on the clues gathered, Captain Aleski believed that the river was not the initial crime scene. If they wanted to find where the crime happened, they would need a lot more information. The forensic results showed that the piece of human skin was cut with a surgical knife. The cuts and stitches were meticulously neat, starting from the groin and extending up to the neck, showcasing a high level of skill and precision. The time of death of the victim was between December 7th and 14th. The cause of death remained undetermined, and even the forensic experts had never encountered such a method before. It was speculated that the perpetrator might be involved in the medical field or animal dissection, given their experience in handling the corpse. However, with the limited evidence, it was extremely difficult to determine the initial crime scene which also complicated the identification of the perpetrator's operational range. After the case surfaced, local media began reporting on Katerina's case, causing a public outcry. Some speculated that the perpetrator was mimicking the methods shown in the films Dr. Killer or The Silence of the Lambs. It was believed he might be imitating Buffalo Bill from the film, leading to a pervasive fear of the psychopathic killer in the city with no one wanting to become his next target. In fact, in Clarksburg, there had been similar skinning incidents 16 years prior. One night, a man had killed his wife and children at their home, then skinned them brutally. He was caught red-handed by the police while disposing of the bodies by the river. Psychological experts assessed the man and found that he had a severe mental illness. The man was sentenced to life imprisonment and isolated in a mental hospital. Before Katerina's case, he was released due to severe heart disease. However, investigations revealed that he was now an old man, barely able to move, bedridden, making it impossible for him to be involved again. Detective Chief Lambert then divided the detectives into three groups to gather information from different angles. Group 1 focused on clues from the human skin sample, Group 2 investigated the victim's relationships, and the final group scrutinized suspicious individuals around the crime scene. The police examined the human skin sample, noting the uneven cuts and stitches around the armpits and groin. It was deduced that the perpetrator had used a sharp scalpel and was possibly making a human skin suit. 
the arteries might have been cut before the victim was killed. And for some reason, the skin suit was discarded into the river. Based on this theory, the suspect was likely craving the girl's body, leading to the inhumane and brutal act of killing her. A lead emerged. Classmates revealed that Katerina had recently taken a keen interest in the band The Grateful Dead and often bought their records. Some friends suspected she was in a relationship because she seemed very happy, wearing makeup daily before going to school and dyeing her hair blonde. The question now was what happened to Katerina while she was out buying records. Investigations showed that from her house to the record store was a bustling commercial area, making it unlikely for a perpetrator to act without being seen. However, there were no reports of unusual activities in that area, and if the perpetrator knew the victim, it could explain the theories suggested by her friends. If the rumors about her dating were true, the person who took her would likely be her boyfriend. However, investigations found no recent contacts, and it was unclear if the rumored boyfriend even existed. The police approached Mrs. Zawada, hoping to learn more about her daughter's situation. She stated that her daughter rarely confided in her, let alone mentioned a boyfriend. However, before her father's death, Katerina had a childhood friend of the opposite sex, but they had lost contact after she fell ill. Using the clue from Mrs. Zawada, the police located Daniel, the childhood friend mentioned. Surprised by the sudden visit, Daniel confirmed that he and Katerina were once very close, sharing everything. He admitted having feelings for her and wanting to date her. They had arranged to meet at a restaurant, but Katerina never showed up. Much later, he learned about her father's death. Daniel also mentioned that he had repeatedly tried to contact her, but she always avoided him, and eventually, they lost touch. He had no idea how she had been living. Devastated by the news of her murder, Daniel requested the police to ensure the perpetrator was brought to justice. Friends of Daniel confirmed his alibi, placing him at school during the time of the murder. Everyone expressed sorrow for Daniel and Katerina, as they were considered a perfect match. The police found Daniel's alibi credible and ruled him out as a suspect. Captain Oleski discovered a new lead. During a sweep of suspects, a team member noticed a suspicious man named Zane. His house was near the Vistula River, and since the body's discovery, he had frequently been seen lurking around the bridge, appearing to search the river. The police decided to investigate Zane. However, it turned out Zane was merely curious if anything else would surface. Over time, no evidence linked Zane to Katerina's case, causing the investigation to lose direction. Even Oleski began doubting his theories. Could the real killer be mimicking movie scenes? This led to the conclusion that the perpetrator would strike again soon. Indeed, five days after Katerina's case, on May 31, 1999, the police received a distress call from an elderly woman. She claimed her grandson had killed his father and skinned his face to make a mask. The police arrived at the scene, a loft, and found a headless male body, identified as the elderly woman's son. According to her, the grandson had brutally attacked his father for unknown reasons, skinned his face, and wore the skin mask to impersonate him. Due to her old age, poor hearing, and impaired vision, the elderly woman initially mistook her grandson for her son. Gradually, she noticed something was wrong. A foul odor emanated from the face, and the skin looked wrinkled. During a close interaction, she pulled the skin, revealing it was a mask, and underneath was her grandson's face. Shocked by the discovery, she contacted the police. This was the first time Oleski faced such a horrifying case. Thanks to the suspect's family member confessing and the substantial evidence, the investigation proceeded smoothly. In the interrogation room, 23-year-old student Vladimir admitted to his actions. He confessed to killing his father, but his words lacked any remorse, insisting that his father deserved such an end. Vladimir claimed that his mother was very kind and faithful to his father, whereas his father was unfaithful. Thus, he ended his father's life, skinned his father's face to create a mask, and planned to live with his grandmother under a false identity. Vladimir's bizarre confession sent chills through the room. 
It was hard to believe that a seemingly gentle young man could brutally murder his own father. However, Alasky thought differently, believing there must be similarities between Katerina's case and Vladimir's actions. The mystery might have been solved. Through the investigation, it was discovered that Vladimir and Katerina attended the same university. Though Vladimir had dropped out a year ago, they still knew each other. Vladimir was Katerina's senior, adding more leads to the university student's case. Alasky almost confirmed that Vladimir was responsible for Katerina's death. In the interrogation room, Alasky persistently pressured Vladimir, but he denied any involvement in Katerina's death, acknowledging that he knew her, but absolutely did not kill her. Alasky began to doubt his confession, but currently, there was no evidence linking him to Katerina's murder, leaving Alasky deeply disappointed. Subsequently, Vladimir was sentenced to 25 years in prison for killing his father. As for Alasky, he was utterly perplexed, unable to pinpoint the issue that caused the case to stall. He wondered what method the perpetrator used to disappear without leaving a trace, a thought that constantly troubled him. In the year 2000, with advancements in science and technology, the police re-examined Katerina's skin and found the DNA of a man. They compared it with previous suspects, but there was no match. The DNA was then entered into the criminal database, but again, no match was found. The case reached a dead end and became an unsolved mystery, with the files and related evidence sealed. Thirteen years after the incident, in 2012, advances in medical technology revealed a completely new clue. A rare plant fragment was found on Katerina's skin with botanists concluding that the plant fibers did not come from a water environment but grew only on land. Therefore, it was inferred that Katerina was not murdered near the Vistula River. The police reopened the case, with Lieutenant Alasky present. An investigation team from the Unsolved Crimes Unit was deployed, hoping to find the crime scene based on the plant's habitat. With the case being reinvestigated, Katerina's body was examined once more to seek additional information. The investigation showed that the plant traces were not limited to one area, but found in multiple locations where it could grow. Unraveling the mystery. Many years had passed since the case began, and evidence from previous years had vanished over time, making the investigation extremely challenging. In this dire situation, forensic experts received new information indicating that Katerina showed signs of abuse before her death. This conclusion was based on a 3D model built by experts from the Kralov Medical University, revealing that Katerina had endured physical trauma before her demise. The murderer used a sharp surgical knife to cut her neck, armpits, and groin, subjecting her to prolonged torture before she died from excessive blood loss. As the riverside was not the murder scene, the most plausible location was likely the perpetrator's home. However, proving this hypothesis was difficult, given how long ago the crime occurred. Even if it were proven, evidence of abuse could have been erased. Without initial evidence, the police had no right to search individual homes, causing the investigation to stall once more. Yet, the police did not feel the same. As long as the criminal was not caught, their investigation would never end. Two years ago, in 2014, a police officer analyzing the suspect's psychology in this case pointed out that the perpetrator had clear violent tendencies, possibly stemming from psychological trauma, seeking to fill the void by committing such heinous acts. Only by doing so could he find satisfaction. Further police analysis suggested multiple factors contributing to the perpetrator's behavior, possibly due to family influence or emotional instability, leading to psychological distortion. Two years ago, in 2016, the investigating police consulted Professor Vieira from Columbia University, a top forensic expert in Portugal and a UN expert on torture trace research. Through experimental analysis, he confirmed that Katerina had suffered severe physical trauma before her death. Moreover, the perpetrator had martial arts knowledge and likely received formal combat training. 19 years after the incident, on a September day in 2017, the police received an emergency call. The caller was a woman in her 50s, reporting a suspicious neighbor. Although muscular, 
He liked wearing women's clothes and often spied on her. Sometimes, this pervert even followed her home. Recently, his behavior had become increasingly strange, making her fear becoming his next victim, prompting her to call the police. This news quickly reached Alasky, who had been tormented by Katerina's case, linking every new case to the past incident. Hearing this, he became suspicious of the neighbor and decided to take the case. Alasky swiftly arrived at the woman's house to investigate. According to her description, the suspect was a burly, elderly man named Robert Janjewski. He was very odd, often isolating himself with minimal social interaction. However, he had a peculiar habit of wearing women's clothes and wigs. Immediately after collecting the woman's testimony, Alesky felt that the name Robert Janjewski sounded very familiar, as if he had heard it somewhere before. Upon further reflection, he remembered that Robert had previously been a suspect, but was released due to lack of evidence. Aleski decided to re-examine his file. Noting that Robert had violent tendencies that manifested from a young age, had a history of animal abuse, had trained in martial arts, and had worked as a surgical assistant at a psychiatric hospital, as well as at an animal research institute. Unmasking the truth. During Robert's tenure at the Animal Research Institute, he exhibited strange behavior. On one shift, he skinned all the rabbits used for experiments. When asked why he did it, he couldn't provide an answer, leading to his dismissal. Aleski's professional intuition told him that Robert was definitely connected to the case from years ago, so he decided to visit Robert's mother to ask if her son had done anything unusual before and after the 1999 incident. According to Robert's mother, she didn't live with him, but occasionally visited. Her son was introverted, unpopular at work, earned just enough to get by, rarely spoke to her and did everything alone, so she didn't know much about his life. She recalled that in 1999, her son didn't exhibit any strange behavior, except he mentioned wanting to renovate the bathroom. Hearing this, Aleski became alert. She continued, saying Robert's income was low, and he lived alone, so suddenly wanting to renovate the bathroom was indeed suspicious. It could be an attempt to hide evidence. If he was the perpetrator, the most plausible scenario was that he buried all the evidence under the floor. After obtaining a search warrant, Aleski and his team went to Robert's house to search. Fortunately, Robert was not home, but the window was open, suggesting he had sensed something was amiss and fled before the police arrived. Entering the house, the police targeted the bathroom, began removing tiles, and discovered a small amount of dried blood under the floor, which had darkened over time. A sample of the soil was taken back to the lab, where DNA testing revealed it contained Katerina's DNA. Finally, the truth was revealed. Robert was the murderer of Katerina. In October 2017, the police arrested 52-year-old Robert at an abandoned factory in Clarkfield, Kachimir. Aleski began the interrogation, but Robert adamantly denied the charges, claiming he didn't know Katerina and had never even heard her name. When Aleski asked why he fled, Robert's answer was laughable, saying he went to a friend's house and forgot to lock the window before leaving. However, his excuses were futile. Despite his denial, the compelling evidence made it impossible for him to escape justice. During the house search, the police also found a diary hidden in the wall, detailing his criminal activities and his stalking of victims. The content was so horrifying that it remained a secret, not disclosed to the public. Because this was a high-profile case, all media outlets eagerly awaited the trial's outcome, but the trial was held privately, leaving the public unaware of Robert's sentence. Rumors circulated that during the trial, he continued to proclaim his innocence. And thus, the human skin mystery comes to a close. Despite the elaborate methods, the perpetrator ultimately paid for his crimes after 19 years. What do you think about this case? The police's efforts were finally rewarded. Did Robert receive a fitting punishment? I believe so. If you enjoyed this case, please give us a like on the video and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, goodbye and see you soon.